All right. Uh, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I'm your host, Brandon Troy, host and co-creator of Movers and Shakers Unlimited. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. I hope everyone is well out there. Um, as you well know from the promo that we had put out previously, we do have a terrific guest uh, joining us uh, today. So give me one moment while I introduce them. Uh, the guests that I have, they do not need any introduction. They are a BAFTA nominee, a NAACP nominee for their writing in Blindside, um, a South by Southwest nominee for the ha uh, Highwaymen. Um, they are a winner of a uh, Christopher Awards winner for uh, uh, My Dog Skip, as well as uh, they also were a winner of uh, uh, for their efforts in saving Mr. Banks uh, with the Palm Springs International Film Festival. Just to name a few, off, uh, obviously, you know, there are so many other, you know, accolades that they've accumulated, as I said, just a few. So without further ado, uh, I would love to introduce writer and director John Lee Hancock of the upcoming film, The Little Things. Let me bring him on. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm good, Brandon. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, so as I said, thank you so much for joining us um, uh, today. And uh, first and foremost, you know, Happy New Year. How have you been? I know it's been, what, uh, a couple of years at this point. Yeah, no, it's been a while since we've seen, seen each other. Um, as for everybody, it's been, you know, an, an, an odd last year and it continues to be odd um, and, and different than the other year. So, um, you know, we've, we've probably all changed our, um, our attitudes and uh, the way we go about business and the way we live life and what we appreciate uh, in these days. Um, so for that, I'm, uh, I'm grateful, although I'm, I'm now um, I'm ready for a, a vaccine. So <laughs> I'm ready to get in line for the vaccine. I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired of myself. I'm, I'm very lucky in that uh, I've had lots of writing to do. I was finishing a movie, doing that remotely, the editing of it. Thank goodness we were finished shooting it already. Um, before everything got shut down, but uh, so I've had plenty to do writing wise. So I've been really fortunate, um, but uh, I'm ready to get back on the set. Definitely, definitely. Um, so just hopping in, you know, to to uh, this film, the the little things. It, I, you know, in in doing some research on it, you know, it's had a interesting. Uh, uh, life, so to speak, uh, which is why I want to come to that kind of that idea of it being, I guess you could call it like a fine wine where, you know, you, you did it, uh, what, almost 30 years ago in writing this film. And it's had like quite a journey through various directorial hands. I understand people like Danny DeVito and, and Spielberg and, and, uh, you know, you pondering whether you want to do it, but based on like the subject matter of it being so dark, you know, you were, kind of, uh, of still wrestling with whether or not you would do it in, in, at certain points. So uh, can you talk a bit about that and then that, that journey of it being, uh, it starting, you know, like I said, nearly 30 years ago and ending up here where it's, it's, it was gonna be a contemporary piece and has now become, I guess you could say a period piece. Yeah, um, I wrote it in 1992. Uh, I, I saw a script, an old script the other day when I was cleaning out the garage that was registered with the Writers Guild in spring of 93. So that tells me I wrote it in 92. Um, and it was originally part of a blind picture deal with Warner Brothers and Steven Spielberg for me to write something for Steven to direct. But he was doing Schindler's List at the time. And when I pitched him this idea, he felt it was just too dark a world for him to live in after having done Schindler's List. Uh, so yes, there were other directors, you know, the, the script was well received by the town and uh, there were, you know, a lot of directors that were interested. Um, Clint Eastwood for, for a minute, I had done, you know, ended up doing two movies with Clint. Um, uh, Warren Beatty, I talked to for about a year about it, off and on. Uh, Danny DeVito, uh, and it almost got made with Danny uh, when he was directing. Um, and then several other, several other directors through the years have expressed interest in it. And around 2000, I started directing for real and, uh, you know, directed The Rookie and Mark Johnson, who was always the producer on it, came to me, would come to me every couple of years and say, what about the little things? And I had small children at the time and it was just such a dark world to live in. 
that I'd want to do it for two years. And that's what it is. When you direct a movie, it's two years of your life. Um, people don't really understand that, I think. And um, anyway, so I, time passed. I directed other movies. And then a couple of years ago, Mark came to me again and said, you know, about the little things. <clears throat> and I hadn't read it in forever and ever and ever. So I thought about it, went back and read it. And <clears throat> to my surprise, you know, really, really liked it. So um, I cleaned it up a little bit uh, and we gave it to Warner Brothers and they owned it. It was an original idea. It wasn't based on any underlying property or anything. It was just something I made up. So they owned it outright. <clears throat> and uh, it's, and again, another surprise was that, you know, it's a, it's a middle range budget adult drama and studios make fewer and fewer of those uh, nowadays. It's all Cape Crusaders and spandex and that kind of stuff. Um, but Warner Brothers said they wanted to make it. And the next thing you know, uh, we were out to Denzel and uh, Denzel and I knew each other a bit through the years. <clears throat> I had done rewrites on Safe House and Magnificent Seven. So Denzel and I had been in a room together and talked story and uh, had some respect there. And uh, we talked about it and decided, he said, I want to do this, let's do it. So in short order, you know, Rami came on and then Jared came on and, you know, I got three Academy Award winners. Yeah, and that is actually a terrific segue. Uh, before I hop into that segue, uh, would you say that, I mean, I, I know that you have a degree in law, that that fascination with law and with uh, crime, do you feel that that played the you know, a role in, in uh, sparking the idea for, for this story? I, you know, I wish I could remember exactly when the idea hit me or what spurred me on to write this. I, I'd always liked crime drama. Uh, I lived in Hollywood in a crappy apartment at the time. Uh, so I was looking around and seeing everything around me all the time. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I don't know, I, I was, there were a whole lot of um, cops and killer movies in the 80s. And the majority of them <clears throat> started off really well. And they had lots of misdirection and clues. And you're trying to figure out who the bad guy is. And then about two thirds of the way through, they identify, they, they identify the killer. And then the third act becomes the good guy chasing the bad guy. And there's usually a chase sequence in an action set piece and then they face off and the good guy kills the bad guy and i always thought that was the least interesting part of these movies um so i, I set out to do one where it felt like a genre movie but it really wasn't and the third act unraveled instead of building toward it builds toward a climax but it's a very different kind of climax so i think it's quite surprising and you know, and so far the reaction has been really, really good to the movie and people are uh, more than satisfied with having a different ending than they expected. Definitely. And like I said, talking about segues, I feel like based on the the journey that as we were talking about at the top that this story had uh, from its beginnings to uh, actually shaping um, in, into a, a film and coming to fruition, the, the fact of having a, a Oscar trio, if you will, in terms of, you know, your cast is, is quite, quite something. So uh, I find it you know, fascinating in terms of just that process, just, just A, the, the trio that you have with those three characters and um, the respective uh, processes that each, you know, Denzel, Jared, and, uh, um, as well as well as as uh uh, uh yeah uh, rami um in, in the film and can you talk a bit about that because like the thing that's funny is that from what i understand i guess denzel based on uh being one of the the primary folks that you had attached uh b before the others that it was very it was uh very collaborative in that even in the process of, of still um, having the production uh, commence, that I understand that he had an office of sorts where you guys were still continuing to collaborate in that process of, of uh, uh, the, the story itself and, and his character. Uh, if so, can you talk more about that? 
Yeah, <clears throat> I, with, with, I like to do as much work in, in prep as possible with the actors. And that doesn't mean <clears throat> rehearsal necessarily. It just means talking and reading through the script and, and, and you know, thinking and talking about tiny little aspects or am I wearing a coat here? Am I not wearing a coat here? And all three actors were really open to that, which is great. Denzel, uh, from the start, when he would just reread the script and reread the script and call me and leave messages, like sometimes 25 seconds long or something, asking a question about this scene or what if I wear a coat in this scene and those kind of things. And so this went on for a week or two and I said, you know, I can set you up with an office right next to mine. We had our big prep offices. And he said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be cool. So his office was right next to mine. Our doors were open and we went back and forth all the time, you know, just talking about that stuff, which gives you a real shorthand because once you're on the set, then, you know, it's a scene that you've talked about 25 times already and have already kind of looked at the dialogue, shaped it, made any changes we wanted to make. Um, so that was really helpful. And then I had uh, Denzel and Rami sit together and uh, we read through the script and talked about it, you know, and so we were, we were pretty prepped. And Jared, I worked with individually without the other two um, so that he would be fresh when he came to the set. And it would be the first time they met Jared would be, they would be meeting him in character. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, also, can you talk, uh, talk more about that, the, the trio and characters in terms of how they operate together? Because I feel it's interesting in that with R Rami's uh, character, you've, I believe you commented on it before, that just that idea of that he's, for all intents and purposes, and, and it's the, the idea that he is a quote unquote, you know, straightforward character and he i guess you can say in many ways he acts as an anchor for uh between uh denzel's uh, character as well as uh jared's character with albert and with uh joe so can you talk a bit about that and and, and him working within that dichotomy too because we're so used to you know rami Payne playing very you know eccentric characters and and unique characters and him reining it in, so to speak, in order to act as an anchor of sorts for uh, the other two characters. He, Rami is an anchor in this. Um, Jim Baxter is more by the book. Um, and Jim Baxter also has the biggest journey in this movie from start to finish. He changes the most. <clears throat> and he, he uh, it's, it's a really, really important role because it allows Deacon to play and be Joe Deacon, and it also sets up Albert Sparma as well. Um, so, you know, Rami does a whole lot of heavy lifting in this movie by playing Jim Baxter. Um, they're all, you know, all three of the actors, every actor you ever work with has a different process um, of how they create a character. And so in some ways, people have said, oh, Jared's a method actor. Well, I mean, every actor in some, to some degree is a method actor. They have their method to get to where they need to get to create a character, but they're slightly different. And so, you, you know, you, you have discussions about that before and how are we going to deal with one another? How can I create an atmosphere that allows you to do your very best work? Um, and that's part of my job as a director. So <clears throat> even though the approaches to all three actors and our relationships <clears throat> were slightly different, um, they were all headed the same direction, so it worked out well. Awesome, awesome. And uh, just prior, you were talking about just that idea of uh, having a second hand. And I feel like in many ways it's, it's fascinating in that, and you've commented on this, having a, I guess you can say a second hand with yourself, because the thing that's interesting, I always find fascinating with those that direct, um, uh, those that write and those that do both, that there is that wrestling of of not being too precious with with what you write, but at the same time, uh, just that idea that if you are uh, the screenwriter, you have to. I believe you a uh, comment that you made is made is breadcrumbs. So not being uh, having a spoon feed, you know, for your director potentially of what you're trying to get across, and as a writer. 
you don't necessarily have to, you know, deal with that because you wrote it. You, you know, you're dealing with it yourself. So can you talk a bit about that dichotomy of, of you know, trying to make sure that you're not too precious with what you wrote, but at the same time, still trying to execute it in the way that you want? Yeah, I mean, when, you, when you've when you written the script, you, you do have, you know, a relationship with it that allows you to understand it beneath the surface. Um, you know, sometimes I write and somebody else directs. Sometimes I direct something that somebody else has written. Sometimes I write and direct. Um, you know, and sometimes I jump on as a producer for somebody else who's writing and directing. The job, the job is the same. The writing job is the same whether somebody else is directing it or I'm directing it in some ways. And that is that the script is there to be a roadmap, a very specific roadmap of what you're trying to, of what the journey of the movie is going to be. And you have to wear a different hat when you start directing a movie, whether you've written the movie or not. Um, you have to be able to look at it and make changes. I think the second hand and understanding allows you to know where you can make changes as you're going and as you're moving that will help and not hurt. Um, and so a deeper understanding of the, <clears throat> the genesis, if you will, of the, of the script and the idea and what we need to accomplish in any given scene is very, is very helpful. I think sometimes when you write something for someone else to direct, um, you, add, you, add, you add more to the script than is probably necessary just to make sure you get your idea across. And that's the idea of breadcrumbs. You're, you're leaving it for somebody else so that you're making sure that they completely understand the intention of the scene. Um, and when you're directing from your own script, you already know that. So, you know, you can be, the scripts can be a little leaner and meaner, if you will. Definitely, definitely. And I mean, it's no secret, you know, with this film, it is marking uh, the first in this new um, strategy that that Warner Brothers is doing and having that dual strategy of, of a theater release as well as uh, a release with streaming. Um, and I know that there are a slew of projects, I understand that there are a slew of projects um, that you are um, uh, working on currently, whether they are in development now, whether they're in production or, you know, you getting it across the finish line. It, with that being said, do you feel like with many of these projects now, with the current landscape that we're in now, that at least within, you know, as you said, talking about the the life commitment that it is as uh, putting uh, putting a production together, you know, two years, three years, four years, that based on the current landscape, that it is tweaking perhaps your expectation or your strategy for current projects that perhaps had, you know, you had a different perception of or or, or a goal for um, in more normal circumstances, if that makes sense.
Sorry about that. I can't hear you. I don't know if you uh, heard, John, what, what I was uh, mentioning uh, just prior. I mean, I can uh, repeat it. I don't know if you caught it uh, right before uh, you left us. But uh, basically, you know, just the idea of with this film, you know, I understand being the first of the dual strategy that, you know, Warner Brothers is doing with having uh, streaming as well as a theatrical release simultaneously with all the other projects that I understand that that are that you have going right now and knowing as you were mentioning you know prior the the huge commitment that a lot of projects take and in, in, with your life within two years three years you know the the lifetime commitment that they can be has it tweaked or uh pra perhaps giving you giving you an idea to reevaluate perhaps you know maybe what what you foresee as a as a release for it um, I mean, you, you, you make the movies the same way, whether they're, you know, going to theaters or going to streaming. Um, <clears throat> I think that, I, I don't know. I mean, I think several things. One, I think there's going to be a streaming component from now on, um, as everybody tries to get in that business, not just Netflix and Disney plus, uh, what that'll look like, we'll see. I also know that it's, you know, when theaters are open and safe to go to, I think people are gonna be dying to go to the theaters. So I, I think it'll be a modification, if you will. It's not gonna be the way it was 10 years ago where um, you make a movie, it goes to theaters. I gotta turn this off, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, you know, where it won't be 10 years ago where you would go to the, go to the theater and, uh, you know, and then after 90 day window, it would it would sell to HBO or something. Um, the windows have already shrunk, um, you know, during this pandemic. And then uh, Warner Brothers, you know, uh, and Disney, you know, sending movies to streaming. Uh, the Warner Brothers was uh, the most drastic because it was day and date uh, with the movie in theaters were available. And then on HBO Max for a 30 day period before it, then it's been, then it's able to sell to other places, other streaming. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a shocker a bit, even though I have to say that everybody, I think you had to think it was a possibility of a streaming component, especially when Wonder Woman announced that they were going to go day and day on Christmas day. So it was surprising and not surprising. Um, the surprising part was that it all happened in one press release and that all these movies are, were in the same boat. Um, you know, mine is first up January 29th. So we had to really, really, Warner Brothers stepped up, made all our deals for the back end. Um, and, uh, and then we went to work, uh, you know, and got a lot of good materials out now. And I was watching, um, you know, I was watching the uh, national championship game last night and <clears throat> there were ads for the movie running. Um, so it's good. It's good. Um, and, you know, they've, they're out on the Internet now. The trailer's out. Um, I think the movie's really, really good. Um, so I guess the, the answer is we'll have to see. I, I don't know. I mean, what's my next, you know, what's my next movie going to look like? I don't know which one it is right now. So. Will it be something for Netflix? Will it be something for Warner Brothers? Will it be some other place? I don't know. And um, you know, with Netflix, you know, you know what you're what you're getting into in that there will not, like for instance, The Highwayman was a theatrical release, but it was a very short theatrical release, like Roma, or like The Irishman. Uh, it's in theaters and then it's released on Netflix, um, so you get Academy Award consideration but it's largely, you know, streaming. And so you ne you negotiate a back end, if you will, up front. And, uh, and so you know that about it. You, you know that about that process. And we'll see whether that comes to pass uh, with, with other studios as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, John, thank you so much uh, for coming on and talking about uh, the little things, uh, the little things. 
Uh, currently will be coming out uh, January 29th, 2021 on HBO Max, as well as in theaters. Uh, before I let you go, can you, you know, uh, tell folks where they can find you? I know we were talking about this, you know, just prior. I know you're not, you know, big on the, you know, social media thing. Nah, I, they can they can find me at the movies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go see my movie. That's it. Other than that, I have no social media presence. I, I, you know, it's, it scares me a little bit. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, there you guys have it. Thank you guys so much uh, for watching. I'm your host, Brandon Choi, host and co-creator of Movers and Shakers Unlimited. Uh, you can find us here on Facebook, live streamed, of course. Uh, however, you could also find us on Twitter at Move and Shake UNLTD on Instagram at Move and Shakers Unlimited. And of course, me, Brandon Troy ENT on Twitter and Brandon Troy ENT on Instagram. There you guys have it. Thanks so much for watching. Be safe out there and I'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, Brandon. Bye bye.